Welcome, everyone. I would say let's start. So my name is Philip Mikulic. Um, I'm welcoming you here to demystifying CNI. So what I want to do with you here is I want to talk about what a CNI actually is, and I want to explain this to you by actually writing our own CNI here from scratch today during this talk. And it's going to be rather simple, so don't worry. If you do not have a lot of experience beforehand with containers, with networking in general, or Kubernetes, it's not really necessary. We'll go through the steps one by one. As mentioned before, my name is Philip Nikolic. Uh, I currently work at Isovalent, the creators of eBPF and Cilium, uh, which is now part of Cisco. So obviously, in order to start this talk, we'll first have to understand what a CNI actually is. In order to do this, uh, let's start with the acronym. The acronym stands for Container Network Interface. The two logos that you can see here are once the CNI project by itself, and the other one is Cilium. Both of these are graduated projects in the CNCF landscape. And when you take this a bit further, oftentimes you think of things like Cilium as a CNI. Technically, and we'll see why, this is not really accurate. There is only one CNI, and the only CNI that exists is actually the project on the left-hand side that you can see here. That uh, particular project is a graduate project in the CNCF and is, is basically defining the protocol of what a CNI is supposed to do. This is what the term CNI actually refers to. So if we were to look here onto the README, the important aspect here is the specification part. So the specification, the CNI spec, is actually what is going on here. So when we talk about a CNI, we're just talking about how things are supposed to work. It is not a particular implementation, it is just how do things work together. In order to illustrate this a bit better, uh, let's assume you have a user. That user is communicating and interacting with the Kube API server. It is doing a lot of stuff, right? It is constantly going to create containers, it is constantly going to create pods, and so on. And so if a user was now to send a pod spec over there to create the best app ever as a pod, it is sending that over to the Kube API server. The Kube API server will then, at a certain point after talking with the Kube scheduler, decide on which node to schedule this on and send that information down to the kubelet. The kubelet is a special agent in Kubernetes, and it is responsible for all things that are happening on the node itself. So this really uh, installed on each and every node, regardless of it being a worker node or a control plane node. And so the kubelet, however, does actually not manage containers by themselves. They do not. The kubelet has a bunch of helpers that help them to achieve whatever task it is they need to achieve. And so the kubelet will reach out to something called the CRI, the Container Runtime Interface. And that one is going to create a container. Then, once that is accomplished, the CRI will actually reach out to the CNI in order to let it configure the network configuration inside of that specific container. And this is what people are usually talking about. However, it's not entirely accurate. Actually, it is not reaching out to the CNI. It is reaching out to something called the CNI plugin. Admittedly, this is now just a bit of semantics and a bit of burdening, but this is the correct term to use. So the CRI will invoke the CNI plugin, and the CNI plugin is actually going to do all the work necessary in order to have running uh, networking configuration inside of that container. And this communication between the CRI and the CNI plugin, this is actually what the CNI is. So you can't really have other CNIs, it's just a uh, documentation, it's just basically a protocol, a specification of how that interaction, how that communication is supposed to happen. And now there is different kind of implementations of the CNI that have their own plugin, such as uh, Cilium, such as Flannel, such as etc. So to keep things simple, however, since the community kind of drove on to the path of calling it the CNI, we'll simplify this on all of our graphics as well and simply call it CNI. From now on. So the goal for today's session is the following. We'll have a CRI that's working and it's going to create something for us. 
it's going to create a network namespace. If you don't know exactly what this is, don't worry, we're gonna get into it in a bit. So it's going to create a network namespace and then it is going to invoke our CNI. But just so you know, I'm not gonna talk too much about how the CRI works and all of these things. There is a different talk that I have later on, which is uh, similar to this one, which explains exactly what a CRI is and how you can write one from scratch by yourself as well. So if you're interested in this, uh, you can either go to the talk afterwards or uh, check out this GitHub repository. So the CRI after creating the network namespace is then going to invoke our CNI and our CNI is then gonna go ahead and put it in there to interface. It's gonna create two interfaces. One of them is gonna be inside of that na namespace, inside of that uh, network namespace, and the other one is gonna be outside. Again, if it sounds complicated, don't worry, we'll get through there. So this is exactly the step-by-step -step guide that I want to show you how we're going to accomplish all this and what it actually means. So from now on, we'll only focus on the CRI and the CNI and the communication between them. So as mentioned beforehand, the CRI's job is to create containers and so on. Just to give you a quick summary, because it's very important what a network namespace is, the way how containers work is essentially they're leveraging a bunch of existing technologies. One of them are called namespaces. Uh, in case you may have heard uh, the term namespace before because you're coming from the Kubernetes world, uh, they're not the same at all. They're just coincidentally named the same way. So the namespace I'm referring to here are Linux namespaces, and they are something that is built into the Linux kernel. So these namespaces, there's a bunch of different ones, but the important one for us is the network namespace. Whenever you start a pod, whenever that's going to happen, uh, it is actually, the CRI is actually going to start two containers. It is going to start one container called the sandbox or pause container. That specific container doesn't really do anything. It is just a very, very simple image that sleeps all the time. Now you may be wondering like, why is that useful at all? So the reason why this is useful is because it is going to give us this particular network namespace. And the network namespace is essentially an isolation, okay? You have to be a bit careful with that word, but this is how the kernel documents it. So you have some isolation going on inside of the Linux kernel. The reason why that is important is because oftentimes you may have certain applications and certain tasks where you want to be able to configure something without it affecting other applications, other things. Uh, for example, as well, the host system by itself. So the network namespace allows you to do the following. It allows you to perform network configuration without affecting the actual system or without affecting other network namespace. So you can go ahead there, you could configure interfaces, you could configure routing tables and so on. And this is what the network namespace is. And the responsibility of creating the namespace is coming from the CRI. So once that is done, the CRI is now going to tell our CNI, hey, there is something for you to do. And it will have to understand how do I call this? How do I call the CNI? And the way how it does this is by checking the following path by default, slash etc slash CNI slash net dot D. In there, it will now look for the very first file that exists. This is why, why oftentimes you will see the a naming convention such as the following, uh, starting with a number. So oftentimes we'll see something like one O minus something or some other kind of number. And this is important because it will just list the very first file inside of that directory. And then it will read that file. That file is a JSON. And that JSON will look like, uh, like this. So it will have in there a couple of things. This is a very minimalistic approach to it. It will specify the CNI version. The CNI version is essentially the version of the spec that I showed you earlier, where it defines exactly how the communication is supposed to work. And then we can assign a name to it. That name can be arbitrary. It's not really important what that name is. And then as well, we're having a type. The type I want to highlight because this one is very important. If we set the type like here to demystifying, it is gonna use that demystifying in the next step. Because there is two important paths that we need to look out for. The next one being 
slash opt slash CNI slash bin. In there, it will now look for an executable, for an executable with the name that we defined in the type. So it is now going to look for an executable named demystifying. And please keep in mind that I'm saying here executable because it does not matter in what language you're writing a CNI. Oftentimes people uh, may assume that everything related to, to Kubernetes, to containers and so on needs to be written in Go. This is not the case at all. And as a matter of fact, we're not going to write any of this in Go ourselves. Uh, we are actually gonna do it in Bash. Why? Because we can make Bash an executable and it's a very simple and straightforward way to do this. So it is then going to execute this executable called demystifying. And it is going to pass on a couple of environment variables with it. You can see here the CNI command is being set to add. There is a CNI net NS uh, variable as well and the CNI uh, IF name, which stands for interface name as well. Uh, we'll get to those in a bit, but just know that basically you're passing on some information through the environment variables. And something that they don't have on this uh, diagram here right now is as well that you're passing further information on wire uh, standard input but it's not gonna to be too important for our use case here. So the first step that the CNI is then going to do is it's going to create so-called virtual ethernet interfaces. Those come in pairs and they're very important. Uh, in case you're not familiar with them, the summary is uh, very simple. Whatever reaches one end of those interfaces is gonna be forwarded by the kernel to the other one. So if you were to send traffic to the bottom uh, virtual ethernet interface, the kernel is going to forward them to the upper one. And it happens in vice versa style as well. So you send traffic through the upper one, it's gonna go down uh, to the other one. Now, this may seem a bit useless at first, but we'll get to why those are important in a bit. So the question is now, how can we create those virtual ethernet pairs? And it's very simple, here's the command. Um, as mentioned beforehand, we're gonna do all of this in Bash uh, because it's very simple and because it fits better on slides than having Go code over uh, spanning over multiple lines. So the command is IP link add that we're gonna use here. We're gonna use the IP command for quite a bit. So with IP link add, we can go ahead and add uh, another interface. And we are then specifying that uh, we want one of them to be called veeth underscore host. So this is going to assign a name to one of those interfaces. And then we're going to specify that the type of that interface is supposed to be a vf, a virtual ethernet, which always comes in pairs. So we need to create a peer as well. And we're going to call that peer uh, vf netns. Now, those names are not too important how we're gonna call them, but the next step that we are gonna have to do is we're gonna have to put one of them inside of the network namespace because there is currently no interface in there whatsoever. So what we are going to do is the following. We're going to move one of them inside of the network namespace. So how can we do this? And this is exactly where some of these things, some of these environment variables are very important that were given to us. So we have an environment variable called uh, CNI underscore uh, net NS, which stands for uh, network namespace. And it will point you towards a specific thing, a specific network namespace where it is located. And so we're going to use that name in order to tell uh, the IP command in which namespace we want to move our interface. So again, using the IP command, we're going to use IP link set, and we're going to specify that we want to move the interface with the name uh, vf underscore netns, and then with netns, uh, we are telling it that we want to move it into that specific network namespace. All right, next things. We now want to assign an IP address to it. All right, we want to assign a P address to it. Um, there's a bunch of things here that we could mention, how exactly the best range to assign these things, how we should do this and so on. But keep things simple, we're just going to hard code it and we're just gonna say 
it is 10.244.0.20. So again, the question arises, how do we do this? Well, yet another IP command. So now in order to be able to edit things inside of a different namespace, we will need to specify that. So whenever we now want to do things inside of the network namespace, we'll have to do IP minus N. The minus N now specifies which network namespace we want to do things in. So if you were to do, for example, an IPA, which is going to list you all interfaces, it is going to do so on the host itself. The host as well has its own network namespace. It has a host network namespace. So whenever you execute an IP command, it is going to do so inside of that network namespace. In order to do it in a different one, you do minus N, specify which network namespace you want to do this in, and then you can do whatever you want. In our case, we're going to add an address and we're gonna do it uh, such as the following address add, specify the address, and then specify you want to add it to the device called virtual ethernet underscore netns. Well, we're gonna do the exact same thing to the virtual ethernet host uh, as well, which is the interface that we have on the host, which just means we're gonna do pretty much the same thing without the minus N, because again, it's then going to look for it on the host network namespace. So what's next? Afterwards, we do not want that um, interface to be called uh, vf underscore netns anymore. We want to call it ethernet zero. Why do we want to do this? Well, if you've ever gone inside of any container and performed an IPA in order to list all of your, uh, all of your interfaces, uh, you might have seen that all of them have always the same name. And the name is usually something among the lines of Ethernet zero. And this is well where one of the next variables come into place. So we have an environment variable called CNI underscore uh, interface name, and there it's specified, hey, please name that specific interface Ethernet zero uh, while you're performing configuration. And so we're doing this. Again, IP command, specify the network namespace, and set uh, the virtual uh, Ethernet NetNS interface to the name Ethernet zero. Quite simple. Well, now we're coming to the next part. Um, the next part is actually how are we making sure that they can communicate with each other? Uh, it may seem like, okay, we assign those things. There is now an interface uh, inside of the container. There's an interface outside of the container. Uh, we have IP addresses. Like they, they should surely be able to communicate with each other, right? Actually, that's not really correct. Uh, the reason why is because imagine you are sending from wherever something to the IP address 10.244.0.20. Imagine you're doing this. Uh, imagine you're doing this, for example, from the node itself. Now the question arises, where exactly is it supposed to send the traffic to? All right. Uh, it is fairly simple if we only think about one container being on the node, but if we had a bunch of different containers on the nodes, you would now have to ask the question, oh, okay, which of these interfaces is the one I need to send them to? And in order to answer that question, in order to give the kernel the information that it requires, we'll have to add um, routing information. And it's gonna be very simple. What you're seeing here is um, an entry, a routing entry on the host. What it is saying is the following. It is saying, whenever you see a packet with the destination being 10.244.0.20, then send that packet to the interface called vf underscore host. So why do we want to do this? Again, because of how the virtual ethernet pairs work, it means that if we send traffic to vf underscore host, the kernel is automatically going to forward it into uh, the network namespace where the other one is, right? And so this is how traffic travels from your host machine inside uh, a container. And so we need to do this in order to uh, make it possible for, for packets on the system to reach the container. So how do we do this? IP route add, we're simply adding this on system. Uh, that's why we don't have any minus n there. Uh, and we add the routing table. 
entry uh, 10 to 144.0.20 uh, slash 32. Uh, and we specify, send them over the device virtual Ethernet host, uh, and we're defining a scope in there as well. And now we need to do the exact same thing for within the container. Um, in order to do this for the container, we now need to think about it a bit differently. We'll actually need to have two entries in there. So same issue comes up uh, as before. Imagine now you want to somehow reach the outer world from that container, right? Uh, you want to send traffic to, for example, uh, a DNS server to Cloudflare's DNS server 1.1.1.1, right? But the question now is, how do you reach 1.1.1.1? Because there is nothing configured yet inside of that network namespace. It is basically a blank shell. It doesn't know where to send traffic to uh, with the destination 1.1.1.1. So what you need to do is you're going to assign a default entry. A default entry basically means, hey, uh, everything, everything that isn't otherwise specified, please send via 10.244.0.101. So basically what we're saying is uh, whatever IP address I'm giving you, please send it over to that IP address. And that's the IP address of uh, the virtual ethernet host, which is on our system. But now we still need to ensure that it knows how to reach that particular interface. And this is why we have a second entry in there. And so we're now saying, hey, if there is traffic that you want to send to 10.244.0.101, then go ahead, please, and, um, and send that traffic over the device ethernet zero with a scope link. In order to do, uh, in order to be able to do this on all two, but I'm not going to get into those details right now. So if we set those accordingly, we are now capable of actually uh, having traffic flowing inside of the container and as well traffic flowing outside of the container as one would expect. So after doing all of this, it is now time to send a response. So the CNI now needs to make the CRI. Um, aware of what it did, right? So it's going to send over like, hey, here are the interfaces I created. They have uh, this IP address, they have those MAC addresses and so on. So how exactly is all of this going to work? Well, in the end, if we look at the results and we put everything now together, here is a recap. We will have to create two files. The one file is a JSON. So if you now were to be on your laptop, you want to follow along, you could just type this up. So in slash at c, cni net.d, uh, you will simply define a file with a very small number in order to make it come up first, which is what the CRI is going to use. You specify the JSON, you leave it in there, that's it. Because we specified the type demystifying, it is now going to look for an executable called demystifying in slash opt slash cni slash Bin. And so you then create there a bash script called demystifying. You specify that it's a bash script. You go through all the steps that we just mentioned. To recap, we create a virtual ethernet pair. We put one of them inside of the network namespace. We assign an IP address to it. We assign an IP address to uh, the interface on the host. Then we're going to rename the interface. Uh, then we'll just have to make sure that everything is up and running. And then we're going to add the routing tables that we mentioned. And at the end, we will have to send back a JSON because the CNI spec is telling us, hey, this is what I expect from you. After I invoke you, after you've done your job, please let me know what you've done. So we have this JSON here um, that we're just going to put in there as well. And the JSON is going to have some interface and some IPs. We're going to get those MAC addresses and those IPs in there. And then we are going to print the result uh, via std out. So once we do this, once we print it over std out, the CRI will know what the result is going to be and it's going to uh, know what to report back to Kubelet and everything will be working. So if we were to test all of this out now, this is how the flow is going to look like. Uh, the person, whoever the user may be, is wanting to create an application. It sends over the YAML. 
the API server at some point will know uh, which kubelet to contact. It will contact the right kubelet on uh, the specific node. Kubelet is going to contact the CRI. The CRI is then going to create the network namespace. And then after creating the network namespace, CRI is going to tell CNI, hey, please do the configuration, which is exactly what uh, we were doing here. And then we would see the following after creating that pod. We would do a kubectl get pods minus o wide. The minus o wide is there in order for us to be able to see the IP address. And so we'll see that there is a best app ever ready and running and uh, with the IP address 10.244.0.20. And if we were now on the node, we could go ahead as well and perform a curl onto that specific IP address and we will actually see that it is working. So, summary, uh, the CNI handles the network configuration and sandbox container. It is actually not a runtime requirement, which means it is just setting these things up initially, right? So it is not necessary anymore to have a CNI after that point. After the uh, pod has been created, you could actually go ahead and remove the CNI entirely and everything will continue to work. Why? Because the settings, the network settings have been made already. You do not need it for any kind of load balancing. You do not need it in order to contact a service. That's not the case. So it is really just there in order for uh, the initial configuration, and then you could actually remove it in those scenarios. Uh, obviously, what we didn't touch on is that there is many, many more commands that you should implement. For example, if you're deleting a pod, obviously you would want to tear all of that down, you would want to remove the entries, you would want to recycle the IP address, and so on. We didn't touch on this, but this is a homework assignment uh, in case anybody wants to do so. And there is two important paths that you need to know for CNI uh, slash etc slash CNI net dot e, and the other one being slash opt slash CNI slash bin. And with that, thanks so much. Uh, in case you want to have the exact code in order to try these things out yourself, uh, in the bottom right, you can see the GitHub repository where I have all of these things. It's as well an entire write-up. You can think of it like a blog post of sorts. Uh, it has a lot of explanations in there. Uh, the code is commented and so on. That's the repository on the top right. On the tap, uh, pardon, on the bottom right, on the bottom left, what you're seeing is the demystifying CRI one which I'll be having later today. And there you will have a Go code, which is a bit longer than what you've seen here, but in case you're interested in what the CRI is doing, that's it. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right, I've been told um, there is a microphone that's supposed to work. Test, test, apparently. Um, so in case there's any questions, feel free to ask, okay. Couple of fans. And yeah, thank you. And in the case, if I want to do more sophisticated, like creating a mesh network or um, mm -hmm. VPN connection, is this also possible because I have to do something more, which obviously works in the network namespace, but this is also covered by uh, this approach if I'm able to write the script or. Uh, exactly. So uh, the CNI spec actually does not tell you how you need to enable the network configuration. It is basically just formulating, hey, uh, we expect that the network is working and we expect you to report something back. If you want to, you can now go ahead and write your own CNI, which is more sophisticated, using VPN things, using VXLAN, using whatever. And this is something that uh, CNIs out there do, such as Cilium, for example, right? Uh, so yeah, you could do all of these things. But with key management, I'm on my own. Uh, I mean, if you write your own CNI, you're on your own all the time. So, yeah, uh, that's key. Uh, pardon, uh, if you may, thanks so much. Um, what I didn't get is where is this opt CNI bin demystifying script actually running? Is it running on the host or in a container which would probably have to be privileged? Mm -hmm. Is it uh, a sandbox container, a dedicated one? Uh, good question. So, this one here, uh, the opt CNI bin demystifying executable. Uh, that you're running is actually running on the system itself. However, if you wanted to, there's absolutely nothing uh, wrong with having this inside of your own container. You would just have to adapt it, always spin up a container or have a long running container uh, in there, and then you can do this. Uh, so yeah, 
you can do it as you want, but in this particular case, it would run on the system so that it already has all the privileges necessary in order to tinker around with the network. Uh, otherwise, yeah, you would need enough privileges, at least cap, uh, um, pardon, at least net admin capabilities in order to be able to do this. Yeah. All right, and further questions? Uh, pardon, could, could you guys hand over? Thanks so much. I'm not sure, um, maybe this is not my, my, my failing knowledge in Kubernetes, but could I also do the same kind of thing for a load balancing IP address with the CNI? Could I do the same thing where I will say this IP address with the CNI just runs a, a command for the load balancing? Um, absolutely, yeah, you can. Um, I mean, to, to give you a, an example, there is actually a functionality inside of Cilium uh, that allows you, for example, to do both uh, layer two as well as layer three things. You could go ahead and assign an external IP address to a service such as a load balancer type service, and then you'll actually listen to that IP address and it will work. So. Uh, you're, you're free to do whatever you want to, and you can take this up as much levels of complexities as you want to. Uh, all that's important is essentially that in the end, you're going to send over that JSON and let it know what you've done. Yeah. All right, any further questions? Oh, another one. So the, the, re the response contains two interfaces. Is the first one just a, a local loopback? Um, no, it's not, it's not the local loopback. Uh, this is one of the very few things that actually is automatically being created. When you create a network namespace, the kernel is automatically going to create a local loopback inside of that <coughs> namespace. Uh, the two interfaces in here are actually the ones that uh, you're creating, meaning uh, the Ethernet 0 one inside of the network namespace and the other one being the virtual Ethernet uh, underscore host, which is on the host side. So that Thank it you. knows about this. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions? No? Amazing. Thanks so much for attending and have a great day.